get a chance this morning to introduce our speaker, Sam Caputu. Uh, many of you know him. He spoke at last Intercon, and we are so blessed and so humbled that he would come to be with us again this year. But maybe what you don't know is the backstory that in 1975, in Nigeria, a group of Nigerian Christians, out of a burden and a passion for the unreached peoples of the north of Nigeria, formed a fellowship, a ministry, a mission called Calvary Ministries, or we know it as CAPRO. And in the 43 years that have passed, now this little seed has grown to a mission agency of over 700 missionaries working in 35 different countries, all over Africa, of course, but not just Africa, five different continents, so Asia, Middle East, international mission agency reaching over 100 unreached people groups. And this is Capro. And fortunately, somehow in the Lord's mercy and grace, right from the beginning, Capro and Weck have been connected in some way. We have been brothers, and we have uh, worked together and laughed together and uh, suffered together and shared the work of Christ together. So we feel this extremely close bond, somehow or other, with Capro. And so Sam Caputu represents Cato, Capro. He is the fifth international director, and Sam and I have been personally great friends. He's been my mentor and my brother, and uh, I'm just so thrilled that Sam is going to speak to us this morning. So Sam, come up, and we'll just introduce you, I mean, just pray for you. I'm also going to pray for Mike Dwight, a brother, leader of ours, and uh, Mike is in the hospital, just urgently went to the hospital, so I'll pray for him as well. Heavenly Father, we start with Mike, and we just think, uh, have mercy upon him. Doctors and nurses, Lord, we just pray you will um, do all that is in your good healing love power for Mike, and just heal him and uh, bring him and restore him. And I thank you for my brother, Sam. Thank you for this godly man who just loves you with a passion that is overflowing. Lord, these are, this is your man, and these are your people, and this is your place, and this is your moment. And I pray now your Holy Spirit will anoint him and fill him and use him for the glory of your kingdom. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Lois. And, um... When you call me your mentor, you're either flattering me or flattering yourself. <laughs> but somebody is flattering the other. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Um, this computer is showing me something I don't want. Okay. All right. Thank you. I need to put this on because I went to an evening school. I grew up, okay, in that area of the world where education is Boko Haram. <laughs> so my parents never really allowed me to go to school at that time. We've grown since then because missionaries came into our part of Nigeria and changed the landscape, changed the culture in many ways, changed our future. And one evidence that missions work Hallelujah. I'm a first generation Christian from my entire lineage. All thanks to some missionaries that obey the Lord amidst challenges and suffering and went to my part of the world. And today, many like me have arisen. If I have my brother Leo, where is he? I have not seen him since I came. Oh, he's up there. You know, God so loved the world, he gave us who? Who did he give us? His only begotten son. You know, we so loved work, we gave them Leo, our one beloved missionary. <laughs> so, <laughs> hallelujah. I bring you greetings from the entire Capro family. Everywhere Capro is represented in 35 countries of the world, they are praying for work this week. They know you are here, and they know God has got to do great things through us. Amen. Amen. I also bring you greetings from my family. I just came from Cape Town, where my daughter graduated from university. So it's the latest picture of my family. That's why I'm putting it up there. And um, they are praying this morning 
they know that from nine, 9 o'clock, Dad will be standing up here attempting to do what only God can do, speak to his people. I thank God that we started this meeting very well. We started with celebration, isn't it? Missionaries celebrate too little. And I thank God that work intercom made it mandatory that we begin with celebration. The joy of the Lord is our strength. The one thing I pray for Capro missionaries and every other missionary each day is the joy of the Lord to fill their hearts. You know, sometimes the hard mission fields, the troublesome team members, the unfaithful support team back home and churches make us lose our joy. But Jesus said, don't rejoice because your work is making progress. Rejoice because your names are written in the Lamb Book of Life. The greatest reason for joy is not that we are successful missionaries, but that we are adopted sons of Jesus. That's the basis for joy. Even if I don't win one soul all my mission life, I will yet rejoice in the Lord. Hallelujah. Sorry. And I thank God that we also began with self-examination. Asking God to watch, wash us clean, forgive us. And I hope that one of the sins you confessed was the ever-abiding sin of restlessness. <laughs> How many of you know that rest is a command? It's the Second Amendment. If you read American, know what Second Amendment is. <laughs> if you read Exodus 20, of the Ten Commandments, the number one command is worship. The number two command is rest. Thou shalt observe the Sabbath day, keep it holy. On that day, do no work. All the other commands are PowerPoint. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. Worship and rest are big. So I hope you confess your sin of restlessness. Because I didn't want to keep perpetrating it. That's why you didn't see me yesterday. I just rested. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Because the first thing Jesus promised to give you was not work. Come unto me, O ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you work. <laughs> what will I give you? It's only as you rest that you can carry a yoke. May the Lord help us to rest. I think that's why the intercon is 10 days. <laughs> Praise the Lord. My desire this morning is that God will refresh us through his word. I feel somehow very incompetent, but when I'm weak, I know he is strong. As Capro, we want to appreciate work, the journey we have come together. At 43 years of age, we're just beginning. They say life begins at 40. So, 40 years as our children said, our missionary children gathered together, and one day they told me, said, said, Sam, the first 40 years is Capro 2.1. No, 1.0. After 40, you must bring about a Capro 2.0. <laughs> I said, what's the meaning of that? I said, the first 40 years was an analog Capro. This next 40 years must be a digital Capro. <laughs> And I'm still trying to figure out what that means. <laughs> but in our analog days, we made a lot of mistakes in our zeal and excitement, even in some of our work relationships. But God is helping us, ever learning, ever growing. Never learning, never growing. So we want to continually be learners in Jesus' name. That's why the first thing you do when you take on the yoke is learn of me. Don't teach me. Learn of me. So this morning, I desire that we'll learn together. I'll just share a burden I bear as I pray for work and pray for mission organization. Every Thursday, we spend a lot of time praying for you and other missions we partner with throughout the Capro world. And as I was praying for Intercon, this was a devotion I had the morning I got an invitation 
to give a devotion at intercom. So I, as I was praying, God said, no, the day you got that invitation, just share the burden you had for that day. And when I shared briefly, we'll take a song. I was hoping my choir would know the song, but they will learn it, ever learning, ever growing as a choir. <laughs> and after we sang the song, I would like for us to pray together with a short time that I have. We're talking about purpose and passion. Only in the place of prayer is passion renewed. Only in the place of prayer is God's purpose affirmed. So the young lion shall lack food, even the youth shall grow weary. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew strength. Amen. So we're going to pray in twos. Make sure you don't pray with your wife. In case... Your family trouble come in between answered prayers. <laughs> Make sure you don't pray with a regular team member in case your feed problems come between us and answer prayer. So find a completely new person and pray with because he doesn't know you, you don't know him or the days of ignorance God overlooks. <laughs> Hallelujah. Shall we pray? Lord, we have asked you to pour out your anointing as we gather in this room. Revive us in passion, in purity, in purpose. Let it begin with me, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. In the, in the notes I sent, I gave you the wrong text. But I'm sure part of your mercy yesterday was to forgive me. Joshua chapter 6. It's where I intended, not judges. May I never come here as a judge. <laughs> Joshua chapter 6. It's a familiar story. Many of you have studied it, analyzed it, criticized it in seminaries and Bible schools. But this morning, just come as a little child and learn from the basics. Hallelujah. We want to talk about taking our Jerichos. Taking our Jerichos. Joshua 6. Now, Jericho was tightly shut inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of war. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus shall you do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets or ram homes before the ark. On the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priest shall blow the trumpet. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people will go up, everyone straight before him. Hallelujah. Taking our Jerichos. Israel had just taken their first step into the land of promise. And the first city they encountered was Jericho. And when the people of Jericho heard that Israel, God's people, were coming, the Bible said they shut the gates. Nobody went out, nobody came in. Does that remind you of some of those closed access countries? Some of those difficult people groups. The moment they hear that missionaries are coming, from the airport, they begin the screening. And some of them don't even allow their people, like North Korea and the other places, don't even allow them to go out freely. China, thank God of late, is becoming more open. So just like Israel, we are marching into the lands God has promised us. We prayed as a mission, we prayed as individual, we met at strategic conferences, 
And God said, march in this direction, march in this direction. And as soon as that happened, the devil goes ahead, gives a rumor. And the countries, through immigration policies and all kinds of policies, begin to shut up. And yet, in chapter verse 2, God says, see, I have given Jericho into your hand. The people and their leaders. Now, when I read the Bible, I ask a lot of questions. Now, the Bible says, God set before us an open door. How come this door was shut? And yet God said, I have given you. Friends, the journey to the nations, the journey to inheriting God's promises, is often marked with dark alleys that can only be stepped in by faith. You hardly see the road. You only hear the voice. God doesn't lead us with the head. He leads us with the heart. When he encountered Saul on the road to Damascus, the Bible said even though he was not seen, he was hearing. So he said when you come to a junction road, he didn't say you will see a, a Google map showing you where to go. You will hear a voice from within saying, this is the way. So those who have learned to master that inner voice are the one best suited to find a direction. If you observe the weather, you will not so. God has helped us in our missionary strife as a mission, as a church, from tiny beginnings in little Palestine, 2017, 18 years ago, the church has marched to two-thirds of the world. In every continent, there are redeemed representations. From our little beginning as work, you know where we have reached. Nations that have been conquered, scriptures translated, schools built, manpower raised, public institution reform, and today churches left in different parts of the world. Because of the grace of God. Can we clap for the Lord? Sometimes, sometimes we are too critical of ourselves. That's why we celebrate too little. No, the, the, the thin line between pride and ingratitude is very thin. Sometimes, in order not to appear proud, we are very ingrate, ungrateful to God for what he has done. The church has marched on. The gates of hell have not prevailed. One thing that Jesus promised was that the gates of hell shall not prevail. That's why I'm not one of those who live in a frenzy fear that one day Islam will overrun the church. It will not happen. Not for the blood of Jesus. Judaism was more vicious on the church than Islam. And yet the first leader of ISIS, Paul, became the writer of the Bible. <laughs> Paul was the first leader of Boko Haram. Al-Qaeda. Just think about it. Communism, with its bold atheism, could not overrun the church. You know the story in China, in Asia, in parts of Africa, even South America. Postmodern Secular humanism cannot overrun the church. When Boko Haram struck in the north of Nigeria, typical of God, the devil knows where God is going, but he doesn't know the route. That's his problem. So just when he thinks he's blocking God, he's creating a highway. You know, the Bible says if he was wise enough, he could not have crucified the son of righteousness. He didn't know. You think that if the devil knew that selling Joseph to Egypt would make him a prime minister, he would have done it? <laughs> so when Boko Haram struck in the northeast of Nigeria, it moved the peoples of the northeast down south. In their mass numbers. And today, through the diaspora ministries, Training local churches to reach Muslim groups, 
churches of northerners are being born in the south of Nigeria. Glory to God. Where we needed to reach them in seven languages in the north, one Hausa language in the south is reaching seven groups. Can anyone be smarter than God? I always say he's a master judoka. You know master judokas or wrestlers? How many of you watch wrestling? South Americans. (laughs) You know a good wrestler will fall on the ground pretending he's dead. Then the enemy will dance around, climb the ropes, and jump thinking he's making a kill. Then the guy moves a little and he slams himself on the floor. And there he goes. That's the way God treats the devil. (laughs) Yet with all the strides we have made, there are yet many lands to conquer. And there are greater oppositions to the gospel now than ever before. Martyrdom, persecution is on the rise higher than ever before. And the sad thing today is that such opposition is not only coming from outside, it's coming from within the church. I remember my first venture in South Africa, and the board chairman of Capro, I had just taken the board through a series on the 1040 window and the challenge of the unreached world, I took the whole boat through that so they can catch the vision to reach the world. And then he was doing a master's degree program in a seminary somewhere in a university. And they had a seminar for that week. What was the seminar? Is the age of missions over. And seminary professor took turns to profound great theory that the age of missions is over. The apostolic era is over. So on the last day of the meeting, it was going to be an open forum for questions. So my board chairman calls me and said, look, Sam, you need to be here. Because this 1040 thing you taught us is not working. So I came to the seminar. And I put up my hand after the summary. And I asked the professor, do you know anything about the 1040 window? And he was ignorant. So I took my PowerPoint went to the front, I became a professor for that day. (laughs) And I took them through this window and I explained the statistics and the progression of the church and the over 95% people in this window that have never had the gospel. They have never heard about 1040 window. They don't know about the Joshua project. They don't know about the 1,347 unengaged people, not just unreached And I became the professor for that day. (laughs) So even from within the church, arguments are arising. How come you are thinking of going overseas when your own country is unreached? When there are so many street kids, when there are so many villages and towns without the gospel, how dare you talk about going abroad when Jerusalem is still in need of the gospel? We are hearing those arguments every day. We are hearing argument that mission agencies are not viable. They are not biblical. And I've had to face that argument. And my only defense is Acts 13. There was a church functioning. When God says, separate unto me. That was the first mission agency. Hallelujah. So there are yet many lands to be reached. So Israel steps into Jericho. And it was short. And yet they had to look at God's promises. The question is, what are our Jerichos today? As we step into the next phase of where Capro and the next dispensation of missions, how do I know we're about to face a next dispensation? I can hear a rumbling in the spirit, and an eagerness of the Holy Spirit for another Pentecost, a fresh baptism. The old wine has finished, and I hear a cry for a new wine. In every church, every mission, there's a cry for a new wine, a new passion for Jesus, a new vision of his glory, a new vision of his kingdom, 
and a new labor force that can go the distance. Why the vast others are retreating in retirement. I hear a rumbling. The Jerichos of today are the closed fields. Closed fields. Many in the Middle East still close and closing. They open and close, open and close. North Korea, Asia. Parts of Africa coming under insurgency and fundamentalism. Even India with the Hindu fundamentalism. Our Jerichos are the resistant people groups in many nations who are saying, we will not have this man rule over us. And they're inventing new ways of rejecting his lordship. Some accepting a form of religion without the power thereof. Nominal Christianity. Even churches closing to mission support and partnership. In Nigeria, one of the fallouts of the insurgency and headsmen vandalism is a growing hatred for Islam by Christians. And many pastors are telling me, Capro, we cannot give you our men to go reach our enemies. We cannot give you our money to go and reach those people. Let God punish them. The prayer of the church is turning from save them to judge them. So even churches are closing. A diminishing workforce. Very few missions are recording increase in enrollment. Rather, attrition rates are rising. It's a Jericho. Dysfunctional teams. As we seek in work to globalize, teams will get more and more dysfunctional. Diversity brings all kinds of challenges. We in Capra are facing it. For 40 years, we were a mission on downward integration, rising up from the little developed parts of Africa to the least developed, because in Africa, most of the unreached people are in rural, undeveloped areas. So it's easy to move from the town to them. You look more civilized. But now we are moving from in upward integration, moving from a developing world mission to Asia, to Europe, where it's developed. And our policies are becoming archaic. Our culture is becoming rude. So we are learning to learn and relearn how to move north. So it dysfunctional teams from a monocountry mission where most missionaries were from Nigeria, now our missionaries come from 26 different countries and 36 different denominations. So when the Anglicans, I said, take it easy. The Baptists, I said, let the water fall. <laughs> and the Charismatic, I said, let the fire fall. <laughs> and so even our mission prayer meetings become dysfunctional. And we are learning to cope with that. It's a war. Hallelujah. <laughs> Where we have labored and handed over the work to other generations, we are facing disloyal and sometimes treacherous imagined leaders who are telling us what right do you have to tell us what to do. You've done your job. Get away from here. And sometimes they are changing the work, the rules. And you are watching. You are not dead. And right before your eye, your labors of many years appear to be going down the drain. There's nothing you can do about it. Sometimes when you don't leave, they push you out. But I thank God that in missions, we practice self-annihilation. The missionary is the only person who works to displace himself. Others work to entrench themselves. <laughs> and all the devil is doing to block the gospel. But it is not only those external Jericho. They are internal ones. Fear. What happens when I retire? What happens when my children go to college? 
What if my children acquire the cultures of these people? And there are those missionary fears. What if support suddenly dries up? Fatigue. Many missionaries suffer from burnout. Either first degree, second degree, or third degree burnout. Third degree leads to depression. Second degree leads to hypersensitivity. You become very touched. First degree leads to weariness and sleepiness. Prayer meeting goes. Bible study suffers. Suddenly you feel like an empty tank. It's a war. Family. Many of you know that 60 to 70% of missionary attrition is because of family issues. We used to say to ourselves in Africa, these white missionaries, these Western missionaries are no good disciples. Jesus said, you must love me above father, mother, brother, sister. How come family always make them leave? And then we come face to face with it in our time. we because of family. Some of our missionaries are having to withdraw. It's a real war. Finances. Next to souls, missionaries love money. If they are not evangelizing, they are mobilizing for funds. And when both are lacking, there's crisis. When the souls are not coming, the finance is not coming, the missionary has a war. Many of those internal Jerichos. The question then becomes, how do we take our Jerichos in the midst of all this? For Israel, God say, see, I have given Jericho into your hand. The first thing is vision. Hallelujah. See. Verse 2a, I have given Jericho into your hand. Keep your eyes on Jericho. Don't look at the closed door. Has God led you into a field, into a nation? Did he give you a promise? A missionary never steps out without a promise. Living by faith is not a question of I don't have money. Living by faith is depending on what God told you when you were going out. And never you step out without a word from God. And when things are not working, get back to what he said. God will never give you beyond your vision. God we never give you beyond what you are seeing. He told Abraham in Genesis 13, after Lot has separated, lift up your eyes to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west. All the land you see, I will give you. So what are you seeing? Are you seeing the closed doors or you are seeing the promised people? The disciples... In Matthew 9, Jesus was ministering. He saw the multitude. He saw the crowd harassed, helpless. And he turned the eyes of the disciple to those people and said, the harvest is plenty. Pray. In John 4, 34, 35, 35 said, lift up your eyes and behold the fields. Vision. What are you seeing? See. I have given Jericho into your hand. The second thing you require is faith. I have given Jericho. Not that I will give or I may give or I could give. I have. Yes, short, he has. Close, he has. Impregnable, there is no closed door for God. He always finds a window in. The disciple with when locked behind closed doors, out of fear, he found his way in. He rose up when he died and went to the grave. He went to the gates of hell and knocked. All gates lift up your heads. Be ye lifted, ye everlasting doors. And the devil say, who are you? I am the king of glory. 
Hallelujah. There is no closed door with our God. Believe him. Any vision and venture with God is only possible by faith in his word and promise. Caleb, you know the story in Joshua 14. 40, many years between the promise and fulfillment, but he kept hold of it. God promised 40 years ago. Years have passed. He has preserved my strength. I will still take the mountain. Peter labored all night, caught nothing. Was about washing his nets and going home like many missionaries. When the feed looks too tough, we wash the nets. I don't know what happens in work, but where I come from, there are one or two things they do. They either apply to go and study leave. <laughs> or they suddenly catch a vision for a new, a new distant field. They become restless. I'm not saying always, but many times. Peter was washing the net, and then Jesus came and relaunched him into the fishing business. Peter said, Lord, you know what? I was quitting, but at your word. Friends, when it appears tough and you are like quitting, maybe the answer is to go deeper. <laughs> Sometimes shallowness can wear you out. In missions as in life, operating above installed capacity can wear you out, but also operating below installed capacity. Let everyone think of himself not highly than your grace, but also not lower than your grace, proportionate. The work you are doing, is it commensurate with the grace God has put in your life? Is the grace of God finding full expression? Or you are playing safe? If you put a Boeing 787-800 series to run between Stuttgart and Frankfurt, it will break down. It needs to go intercontinental. May the Lord give us understanding. Faith is the next thing. God says, I have given Jericho, believe me. Bible heroes were heroes because they believed God, even if they didn't see the promise. They held on. The, the other thing you need is engagement. God says, march through, take steps. Don't just stay afar praying for Jericho, believing for Jericho. March around Jericho. God battles are never won, but, you know, God battles are never won by just prayers, conferences, and consultations. One of the reasons I get weary of many missions consultations, many missions conferences, it's all talk and no work. How you don't reach nation by consultations or conferences. You reach nation by taking steps. Praise the Lord. When God gave Abraham the vision in Genesis 13, in verse 17, he said, march through the land. Walk, walk through. Take steps. He didn't say run through. He didn't say jump into. He said walk. How do you walk? One step at a time. But walk. He told Joshua, everywhere the soles of your feet, not everywhere the prayers of your heart or the eyes of your vision, where your souls I will give you. The disciples in Matthew 9, he told them to pray. Isn't it? Is that not correct? Matthew 9, 38, pray the Lord of the heaven, isn't it? In chapter 10, he turned around and said, go. The same disciple that we pray. So, it takes engagement. But it also takes effective teams. God's battles are not won by individual heroes. 
but by weak people working together in teams. Alexander the Great said, I am not afraid of many lions led by a sheep. I'm afraid of many sheep led by a lion. When there is a team and proper leadership, the weakest group can become strong. Praise the Lord. Moses in Exodus 17 built a team. Joshua, you know the story of mission partnership, very popular. Joshua went to the mission field. Moses carried the rod of authority, prayer to the mountain. Aaron and her were providing the physical support. And the work on the mountain was determining the result on the field. Many times, the poor results on our feet are because of weak support teams at home. So in Capro, we take time to build strong praying teams. We call them Capro support teams, Capro sending teams. They are the group that make our work happen. They are the ones that fire the bullets. We are the bullets. You are just a bullet. Somebody has got to fire you. And when the devil is looking for who to catch, he doesn't go for the bullet. He goes for those firing. If a gunman walked into this hall, God forbid, as we say in Africa, if a gunman walked into this hall and started firing, you can do one or two things. If you want to stop the killing, you don't go picking the bullet. What do you do? You pin down the gunman. Do you notice that in Exodus 13, when the devil wanted to stop Joshua, he went to Moses and weakened the hands. Before you look for money, can you find people to pray for you? They are the bullets, they are the guns that fire you. Hallelujah. Joshua, Jesus had a team. As soon as he launched out, he began to recruit. Matthew 4. He began to recruit. He was a son of God, anointed greatly, but he needed a team. Paul spoke about Apollos. I, somebody saw, somebody waters. God give the increase. It's got to be a team. It's not just a team within work. It has also got to be a team out. Peter was told by Jesus in Luke 5, go and cast the nets, plural. He went and cast a net, singular. It almost broke. Thank God he quickly found partners on the water. But when you are building partnership, don't go building partnership with carpenters when you're on the water fishing. <laughs> Build partnership with other fishermen already on the water. Let me rush to close. Good partnership. Prevailing prayer. Hallelujah. God told them to get the priest to march forward with praise and prayer. Every apostolic move is usually a product of a prophetic move, which comes from prayer. How do I mean? I see Lois hungry. It burdens me. I said, Lord, please give him food. Give him food. That's prayer. Now, a prayer that ends with prayer is bad. Prayer must end with an assignment from God. Critical thing about prayer is not what you are telling God, it's what God is telling you in return. When does prayer start? When God has not spoken. When does prayer end? After he has spoken. So God will say, you know what, go to the kitchen and get Lois a cup of coffee. The word he spoke, go to the kitchen, is the prophetic move. My marching to the kitchen is my apostolic move. So every apostolic move, what you do for God, must come from what God has told you, which is a prophetic move, and it only comes from prayer. So Judah always led the battle, Judges 1. In the Nehemiah project, there were people building, there were people keeping watch. There were people bringing the resources. The Bible says, weapons of warfare are not carnal; they are mighty through God. For pulling down stronghold. Those closed doors, those gates, 
Those Jerichos can only be opened by prevailing prayer. I think it was in one of the work books. I read many books from work. But it says, the history of missions is the history of answered prayers. Every inch of advance is by prevailing prayer. If there's one thing God must revive in work and in the mission community is the power of prayer. We strategize, we consult, we plan, we pray little. Hallelujah. The enemies of Christ and the gospel are getting relentless and more sophisticated in their plot to deny him lordship over the nation. Nevertheless, we must hold on to his promises, our vision, and passion. Shall we rise up, take a song? Sorry. Do we know this song? The choir say they don't. <laughs> we will cross every border, throw every door, join in our hands across the nation. We proclaim Jesus is Lord. We will pray sins of pressure. Speak out.